skip my presentation. All right, well, let's get started. Well, thank you so much, Orange Audubon Society, for inviting me to participate. Um, you pretty much said it all, Deborah. Uh, I, I was doing migration counts for raptors and raptor research in the Black Sea area uh, during a time when the Hawk Watch fell into sort of a, a, a vacuum. Uh, and the Hawk Migration Association of North America announced that they wanted to restart the Hawk Watch. And at the time, only a few of us showed up. I think Jim Eager is probably uh, one of our participants here today. And it, him and I met during that first meeting to revamp the Hawk Watch. Kind of no one else showed up. And it seemed like a tremendous feat. And uh, little by little, uh, with a lot of... Uh, sweat equity and trying to convince local organizations, we were able to start a new independent uh, reimagining of the Hawk Watch, keeping the same protocols and the same projects, the same projects as had been done since the uh, mid 90s, but adding uh, more volunteer involvement. So, um, this presentation. What I'll tell you what it's not going to be. It's not going to be a raptor identification workshop because you have some wonderful workshops, as Deborah mentioned, already in the Orange Audubon roster. And I would I highly recommend November 7th webinar by Jeff Bouton. Jeff is with COA Sporting Optics and he is on at our advisory board at the Florida Keys Hawk Watch, and he is an excellent raptor file. And I couldn't imagine somebody doing a better job at a, at a raptor uh, identification webinar. I'm gonna talk a little bit about swallowtail kites and shorttail hawks, but you have two presentations, to, uh, one by Sam Mitchum on August 15th and one by Gina Kent and Ken Meyer on September 24th about swallowtail kites and short tail hawks. So I'm going to only skim the surface. What I wanna share with you is all the wonderful attributes that our project brings to uh, bird migration research. Um, because often when I talk, talk to folks, they don't know about our project and we always wanna bring new folks in and, and, and grow our, our family. So the Florida Keys Hawk Watch is the southernmost bird migration monitoring station in the US. And what I'm sharing here with you is a map of hawk watches that enter data daily to the online repository called Hawk Count by the Hawk Migration Association of North America. And if you notice, there is a density of reporting migration monitoring sites in the Northeast. But as we get down towards the Southeast, there's this sort of black hole, the Carolinas, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, there are nearly no migration monitoring stations. And in this case, I'm excluding banding stations. I'm talking about this practice of doing point counts from a single location and documenting every individual bird in flight that moves through South. And this is a long tradition throughout the world, especially in the US. But we see that in Florida, we are basically alone. You see another little flag in North Florida near, near uh, uh, St. Augustine. And that was a count that unfortunately no longer is taking place at the Guana Reserve. And um, I hope that they can sort of bring back the energy to, to, to do that count again, because it was really fun to bounce their numbers against ours. Okay. So, so it's really important to think about the fact that Florida is this finger pointing the way to birds leaving North America during the fall towards the Caribbean, South America, and beyond. Yet our organizations don't know to put emphasis in that conservation initiative. And we always want to open eyes to the public because we have a lot to grow in terms of this migration, uh, bird migration culture in our state. Our project is also an important contributor to the raptor population index project. So 
a lot of these projects uh, have sort of their bread and butter species that can be found throughout most of the US and Canada. We're talking about the Sharpshin hawk, the Cooper's hawk, Northern Harrier. These are our stats. I'm not gonna get too much into that. I just wanna show you that in that respect, we're very similar to most hawk watches throughout North America. We get those sort of eight common diurnal raptor species that move through most hawk watches, including broadwing hawk, which really is the, the primary species that a lot of the hawk watches in the Northeast and Midwest are counting as they move through by the hundreds of thousands along mountain ridges. And they continue down the Mississippi flyway and circumnavigate the Gulf towards the West and primarily go through Mexico and Central America. We also get a nice number of red shoulder hawks, but red shoulder hawks stop migrating in Florida. So we, we don't see too much movement with them. The first bird that people ask about when they visit our hawk watch is red tail hawks, yet it is an uncommon species in the Florida Keys. We, we've never seen more than five during a single season. They just simply probably don't like the heat. But what we are really known for is as the highest count for migratory falcons on the planet. And there's nowhere else on earth where you see more peregrine falcons during migration than the Florida Keys Hawk Watch. Our high seasonal count is 4,459 peregrines in a single season with an astounding 1,506 during a single day on October 10th, 2015. And I want you to pay attention to that date. It's October 10. The peak of peregrine migration is from October 8th, roughly October 14th. But year after year, the 10th and the 11th are the peak flights for that season. And what happened that particular year was that we had that super storm that hit the North Atlantic and, and the Mid-Atlantic. And for about a week, bird migration stopped and we were just suffering down there. And to the point that I wasn't even at the Hawk Watch, I was kind of a, away from the count and Ted Kyle, our lead counter that year was at the site. And early in the morning, he texted me, you have to come over here. It's only 10 o'clock and I'm already at a three digit count for peregrines. It's happened that as soon as the weather dissipated, that week's worth of peregrines decide to all fly through in a single day. And if you've ever seen these movies where they're showing medieval armies shooting arrows over the fort's wall simultaneously by the hundreds, that's what it was like. Just these bullets of peregrines flying through at high speeds all over the sky. And it was just magnificent. And it continued on until the last hours of the day. Our site is also one of the top three sites for merlins. And um, we see as many as a thousand during a single season. And when you think about the fact that merlins are boreal breeders, the bulk of the North American merlin population winters in the US. So those 1,000 or so merlins that come through the Florida Keys are on their way out of the continent. These are the hardiest of the merlins. And the merlin is a hardy bird. And these birds are probably very long distance migrants going beyond the Caribbean into Northern South America, Central South, uh, South America. It's really magnificent. Every time I see that, my heart goes out with them. And of course, American kestrels also, unfortunately, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, you may already know how throughout North America, we're seeing steep declines of American kestrels. Those 4,000 plus kestrels that we used to see years ago, we're no longer seeing those numbers and, um, Many agencies are looking at what's happening with kestrels. We're one of the top sites in the world for ospreys as well. We get to see well over 3,000 during any given season. Um, our high daily count for ospreys is 394. And they act very different from the local ospreys. A lot of people are surprised. Wait, ospreys migrate? 
especially if you live in Florida, we get that question quite a lot. And when you see these migratory ospreys, they're acting very different, sometimes flying really high, very determined folded wings or cupped wings. Just they don't bother to even look down, rarely are looking for, 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 for food. And if they do catch something, sometimes they'll take it on the wing and continue their migratory flights. Our Hawk Watch is also the best site uh, for a diversity of kites. We are the only site that regularly counts significant numbers of swallowtail kites. Um, and we're positioned to be that site because most swallowtail kites in North America are breeding in Florida and they are going southward, unlike Mississippi kites, which the bulk of them seem to circumnavigate the Gulf westward and migrate through Mexico and Central America. And we've also documented snail kite and whitetail kite. I have to remember that whitetail kite also has breeding populations in Florida, one near the Everglades and another small population near Central Florida. So in terms of diversity, our hawk watch is excellent. And I wanna talk a little bit about the kites. Uh, this year, our project is more than a month longer than it has traditionally been. And we're extending it to start August 1st. So today was the fifth day of count already in, in progress with the aim of trying to better understand the migratory flights of swallowtail kites. So when we would traditionally start our hawk watches back in the day, September 15th, and then we started creeping to September 1st, even that, by that time, the bulk of swallowtail kites had moved through because what we know, especially from the work that the Avian Research and Conservation Institute is doing, monitoring these large aggregations of swallowtail kites at roosting sites in North Central and Central Florida, we know that by mid to late July, a lot of those birds already are on, their, on the move southward. And by mid-August, the majority of them have left entirely the North American continent. So you see here that on 2014, our, we, we had a record flight, which blew all the other hawk watches out of the water which was at 255 birds in 216, the year that we started the Hawk Watch the earliest. Now, August 1st being our first day, we are currently at 266. Uh, I'm sorry, we're, we're currently at 133 uh, swallowtail kites, which is already half our record count in just five days. So we're expecting to learn a lot about when these swallowtail kites move through the keys. We may find out that not enough move through the keys because we know from transmitter data that a lot of them will fly over water, taking off from Southwest Florida directly towards the Yucatan. We have learned in just the last couple of days that a lot of swallowtail kites are moving through early in the day. And we had suspicions of that. We've also seen in, in prior seasons late evening movements of swallowtail kites in large groups. So we're gonna find out about perhaps a preference in terms of daily flights, whether they're moving in the morning, throughout the day or in the evening, and how these flights correlate with the exodus of kites in these roosting sites. Another aspect of our, our diversity in the Florida Keys is the short-tail hawks, another Florida specialty. Um, we get the highest count in North America for short-tail hawks because this is almost exclusively in our continent, a Florida breeder. And the end of the road for them is Key West. A lot of them will winter in South Florida and the Everglades and the mainland. So it's nice to see that movement into the Keys the numbers are not that great, but this year, as we count later into November, because we're also extending that part of our project, we will likely see a greater number of bootios, especially the Swainson's hawk. A lot of people forget that we have a small wintering population traditionally in South Florida of Swainson's hawks, 
We do not understand where these birds come from, what their movements are. We just see them every season. It's almost as if they're coming down along the western Gulf Coast of Florida, crossing Florida Bay, coming in contact with the Keys, maybe coiling back into the mainland where they tend to be seen wintering along the Everglades agricultural fields out there, less so in the Keys. So I won't bore you with all of these stats, but it's important to remember that our Hawk Watch is run by volunteer researchers, vetted, quote unquote, professional in terms of their set of skills and experience, volunteers that don't get paid for this work, but are out there anywhere from, on our typical season, 45 to 63 continuous days, counting every day, all avian species from two sites. So during any given season, we could see 170 bird species that are documented as individuals, every single individual species into these very detailed forms, as many as 230,000 individual birds documented in this format, more than 30,000 raptors of 19 species. And we're working on our 20th because Luis, our hawk counter, just recently saw a zone-tailed hawk in the Keys. And we're hoping that it'll stick around and come through the hawk watch. With more than 3,000 field and lab hours during the season to gather this data, which is accessible to the public in real time. So our typical season, as I said earlier, started in September and never extended beyond November 15th. And this 22nd count, our season will, has already started August 1st and will run well into November. We're hoping to have 120 plus potential days of monitoring if the weather does not get in the way. So we're out there, rain or shine, a minimum 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. We often start earlier, as is right now with the case of kites, and we often, especially in the peak of migration, when the peregrines come through, we're often counting until last light. So as Deborah had suggested earlier, please go to floridakeyshawkwatch.com. You can learn more about what's happening on, on a regular basis, you can connect there. If you go to the results tab to our latest count data, you can connect to our sponsors. Koa Sporting Optics is giving our, our Hawk Watchers professional equipment to use during the season. And they've been great support. Jeff Bowden is also on our board and an excellent birder in Florida, a great friend of Raptors. Phone Scope Adapters is our new corporate sponsor, and we are under the umbrella of Tropical Audubon and Florida Keys Audubon. Please click on those links and find out what they're doing also. And, and I believe you're going to have in September a talk with Michelle Davis uh, from the Cape Florida Banding Station. It's sort of our sister project, and we do a lot of work with them. Florida Ornithological Society is also a great sponsor of the project. Okay, so, so where are we? Where are we at the Florida Keys Hawk Watch? The little rectangle that you see there below the Florida Peninsula is the Middle Keys. And a lot of people forget that the Keys really jut sort of east to west rather than north to south as lore tends to suggest. We are really in the Caribbean at that point. We could easily break our state into four different parts. Here, we are really are in the tropics. So if we zoom in, and the little red dot is the general area where our sites are. We are coming in contact with some birds that are flying down this traditional Atlantic flyway, if you may, and, get, and, and coming up to the Florida Keys and making a decision whether to continue south by water towards Cuba, over water, or whether to follow that northeast to southwest island chain trajectory and coming into contact with us eventually. But what happens with a lot of these birds is that they find a moment when they decide the weather's good, I'm fit, I'm fed, and I'm going to just go south. And that could happen before they get to us, or it could happen well after or immediately after they get to our sites. But we also get plenty of birds 
that seem to be coming down perhaps the Mississippi Flyway or veering more westward along the Atlantic Flyway and are circumnavigating the Gulf along the west coast of the peninsula, coming to the 10,000 Islands or Florida Bay area and just skimming over that area of shallow waters, Florida Bay is roughly about 850 square kilometers or, or half a million acres of shallow water with uh, hundreds of islands all within Everglades National Park and birds easily navigate over these islands because there's plenty of land to use a stopover habitat and the water is really shallow creating excellent uh, thermal activity that allows birds to get altitude and gain distance. So if we simplify this map, the little rectangle again is showing you to the northeast, Long Key State Park. We start the mornings doing transit counts there. This has already been part of uh, 10 years worth of data that we've been gathering as part of the project. It, it was born out of uh, realizing that high numbers of migratory songbirds come into contact first thing in the morning with the, the diversity of habitats there, and that there are also many roosting raptors that wake up after having spent the night in, in those habitats at Long Key. And then a little bit later in the morning, the traditional hawk watch takes place at Curry Hammock State Park in Little Crawl Key, just northeast of Marathon. So the little triangle that you see there in green is uh, the Golden Orb Trail in Long Key State Park. And I'm gonna quickly run you through what these trans accounts look like because I don't wanna solely focus on raptors. Really our project started about raptors and we put so much emphasis in that, but we are documenting all birds moving through. And a lot of it is done as detections in flight and particularly with the trans accounts, it is done by ear, sometimes in very low light. So if you've been to a hammock in the Florida Keys, you may recognize say a gumbo limbo, which can also be found in the uh, Florida mainland in South Florida. But soon you realize that these jungle-like habitats have many trees that reach their northernmost ranges in the Florida Keys. So we're no longer in Kansas. And in many ways, the birds already are acting as if they are in the Caribbean. And you're gonna hear me say many times, our site is the best for this, is the best for that. But I'm telling you, those mornings when you get out into the, the transit counts early in the season, arguably the best place to see Chuck Will's widows. They're no longer displaying, they're not vocalizing they are just still trying to pretend their bark. And I can think of nowhere else where you can find such numbers of chuckles widows. And of course, the songbirds start moving through. Early in the season, we get to see a lot of prairie warblers, red starts, northern perilous, black-throated blue warblers as the bird on the right. The Florida Keys are amazing during the fall for just oven birds galore using that leaf litter in the hammocks, black and white warblers, water thrushes. There's, that's a northern water thrush in the top right. Excellent place for Swainson's warblers in the fall. At this time, they're not acting as they do during, in, in their breeding grounds, but they're just ignoring the observer and just uh, urgently feeding on little spiders and, and, and little bucks on, uh, throughout the leaf litter. And, and the list goes on and on, black burnians and chestnut studded warblers as can be seen on the top, black for the greens. After we do the hatch of the loop, it turns into mangrove forests where um, along the coast we have these berms and sand dunes up against hammocks and a diversity of ecotones. And we've counted some of the highest numbers of Eastern kingbirds anywhere in North America. Our highest count for a single day in just a matter of minutes is over 4,000 Eastern kingbirds moving through these berms. And often as they're moving through, they're flushing out numbers of 
gray kingbirds, which is another Florida specialty. And some of you in Northern Florida may not be too familiar with this species. It looks superficially like an Eastern kingbird, but it's grayer up top with a dark mask and that almost comically large bill. Uh, by the middle of the season, you'd be hard pressed to find many gray kingbirds. And by the end of the fall, they're almost all gone. They, they almost entirely leave North American continent. Um, these berms also hold excellent uh, poison wood trees that tend to be fruiting earlier in the season, just in the peak of songbird migration. And the poison wood is related to cashews and mangoes and the fruit in a sense almost look like little miniature mangoes, but do not eat one because you're gonna have a terrible reaction. The name poison wood is well earned, but the birds love this. Woodpeckers, tanagers, even seen flocks of laughing gulls on the wing, picking the fruit, hovering over the, over the trees. And of course, the, the bird that loves these fruit is the white crowned pigeon. We also document in terms of any uh, migration monitoring station, the largest numbers of white crowned pigeons. Um, and, and it's really beautiful to see them as they start moving through sort of an exodus throughout the, the, the beginning of the season. A lot of times eastward, uh, perhaps going towards the Bahamas or, or even northward as many will go into Everglades National Park for the winter. And here you have the adult on the left with that stark cap, th those scaly uh, napes, and even a blush of purple in the back of the nape that a lot of people don't notice. And then a young bird on the right side, a lot dingier and uh, those that don't have experience always scratch their heads when they see that. What is that? Do you see the mockingbird in the middle of the poisonwood tree? It's that bird is in heaven right there with all the food to eat. And of course, cat birds love this as vireos do too. And it's not atypical to find three species of vireos early during migration when uh, the wide-eyed vireos are moving through red-eyed vireos are coming through. And the same thing as happens with the kingbirds kind of happens with the vireos as the red-eyed vireos start moving through, they sort of flush through the black-whiskered vireos, which is the photograph right here. Um, another South Florida specialty. It's the only bird pretty much that you'd be hearing singing in the middle of these hammocks in, in, in June or July. But they also leave uh, the US entirely by the middle of the fall. And in recent times, we've been seeing an increase in Florida of thick-billed vireos. And last season, there seemed to be uh, several or a couple of juvenile thick-billed vireos um, that were spotted during the transit counts, maybe evidence of breeding. And if you're not familiar with the species, this is considered a vagrant, a rare species in Florida perhaps increasing uh, uh, in regularity in, in Florida. So all kinds of excellent surprises are possible uh, during these transit accounts. One of the aspects about it that I love is moving through these hammocks and finding these roosting budios, especially into October as large numbers of broad wings start coming through. If you walk through carefully, the, 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 our, our hammocks there are very low in, in height because of all the storms that pummel the Florida Keys. So you get this intimate experience with these raptors that are just waking up. And if you look carefully, you'll also find short-tail hawks that seem to find comfort in the numbers of broad wings attracted to these roosting sites. It is so difficult, as many of you know, to find a perch short-tailed hawk anywhere during the breeding season or during the winter. And um, we've had really good luck uh, during migration when they come to these roosting sites. The transect then goes into this salt pan or xeric area that toggles between being very dry and big by the sun with uh, the ground all, with shards of coral and shells and periods of 
big floods, either by rains or, 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 or by the tides, as can be seen on the, uh, in the photograph in the bottom left. So that's the same trail, but with water up to uh, your calf or halfway up your knee. And as you start scanning through these open uh, salt pan trails, it is a great place to find falcons perched. And our hawk watch has been voted time and again as one of the top 10 sites to view raptors, in part because of the, these experiences, these possibilities of seeing raptors perched on these storm strewn snags uh, from uh, dead buttonwoods or mangroves. And any given morning, just scanning through these snacks, you can see half a dozen to 10 merlins just waking up, getting ready to, to, to carry on in their flights. And if you look carefully, some of the merlins are not gonna be merlins. The bird on the right is actually a young Mississippi kite that looks a lot like a merlin. During migration, in flight, in a, in a, in a determined flight through a migratory site, a Mississippi kite is not acting kite-like buoyantly and chasing dragonflies, but it looks a lot like a falcon. And folks without much experience often confuse them for a peregrine or a merlin. And it's really, and, and that's because they have pointed wings and that square cut tail. And it's really interesting to note that young kites, because of the streaking and the brown overall coloration can also look like a merlin. And of course, these salt pans are fantastic for peregrines of all ages and, uh, and plumages. Some of them allowing you to get quite close like the bird here, the young bird here on the right that allow me to get just below it and take a wonderful photograph. And you can find sometimes up to 20 or, 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 or two dozen all around you in these snags. I love the photo of this. Uh, adult male here on, on the right, on the left, I'm sorry, you can see how slender it is. Weather also plays a big role in terms of how migration presents itself in the Keys. You have to remember that a lot of these sites are much less than a mile in width. They're, they're very intimate spaces. And Squall lines like this can come and go in the blink of an eye. It can be pouring rain with strong gusts one second and be sunny the next. And numbers of songbirds can sometimes move through, especially early in the morning ahead of these squall lines. And in 2014, in a period of half an hour, I counted 650 blue-gray gnat catchers flying low ahead of a squall line like this. These are photos that I took with a point and shoot camera without even zooming in. They were all over the sky, moving ahead of the squall line, none of them stopping, all with their eyes set on Cuba. Just amazing. This is the stuff that just gives me goosebumps. So after we finish the transit account, we move on to the hawk watch, but there's already been either a hawk watcher or a group of hawk watchers that have started the count there. The A there in red is little crawl key, the little circular key where we've been doing our hawk watch since 1999. Now let's talk a little bit about what a hawk watch is. We can't lose sight of the fact that just a few decades ago really, uh, state and local agencies were paying folks to shoot diurnal birds of prey because they were considered pesky. And particularly in the Northeast, a number of notorious lookout points were popular with hunters. Sites like Hawk Mountain in Pennsylvania, which is a mecca of sorts for hawk watchers, came up with a formula where they integrated the research and advocacy with recreational opportunities with the goal of raising the appreciation in the public's eye when it came to diurnal birds of prey and a fantastic bird migration community has grown around that and is very much alive in the Northeast. 
when it comes to Florida, you think like, well, you know, we're kind of new at this and in ways we are, but I'd like to point uh, to this interesting document from the year 1535, the general and natural history of the Indies by Gonzalo Fernandez de Oviedo y Valdez, where he writes this beautiful passage, every year there pass from the end of Cuba, infinite numbers of diverse sorts of birds, which come from the north of the firm land, that is Florida, and cross over the Alacrane Islands and Cuba and fly over the Gulf southwards. So Ovidio Valdez was working for the crown of Spain as a natural historian, and he was uh, stationed in the Florida Peninsula, the Caribbean, the Yucatan Peninsula, documenting all kinds of natural phenomena. And this was basically what he was documenting. Five, five, 500 years ago, he was doing the first hawk watch. He continues, so many that they cover the sky. The lowest are the eaglets and the eagles and all seen birds of prey of many kinds and plumes. Just beautiful. You'd think that in those 500 years, we've learned a lot about raptor migration to Florida. But we have not. We have so much to learn. And it really wasn't until the late 80s and early 90s that the first diurnal bird of prey counts were conducted in the Florida Keys uh, by National Audubon and the office out of Tavernier. These were single day, count, day counts throughout the season, primarily to try to understand rumors of large falcon flights and roosts in the Florida Keys. And we have to remember that this was a period um, when peregrine falcon populations had been devastated by the use of organic chlorine pesticides, DDT in particular, resulting in eggshell thinning. So the Eastern migratory population of peregrine falcons was extirpated. So when on October 13, 1999, that group counted 129 peregrine falcons from Boot Key, which is just a tad bit north of our current count site, a lot of heads turned. And ever since the project has been built upon and has gone through uh, a rapid uh, evolution, and we arrived to today. So here is our count site. This is at Curry Hammock State Park, the beautiful little bathhouse from where we count still today. We started counting there in 1999, about the time when the state park first came into existence. This is a photograph of our new deck. And if you've been to the Hawk Watch, say three years ago or before that, you would have seen a tiny little deck. And now after Hurricane Irma, which devastated the region, we had an opportunity to work with the state parks to increase the size of our deck. And, and we're so happy because we can better host uh, groups of uh, field trips from schools or festivals or, or, or host workshops. This is a photograph of our older deck. You can see how tiny it was and, and how cramped the situation was. <clears throat> You can find these kinds of charts on our website, and I'm not going to go too deep into this uh, because there's a lot of numbers in there, but you can get a sense of the diversity of, of, of our site in terms of diurnal birds of prey. We get those uh, staple species, bald eagle and, and, and the uh, exhibitors and budios, but you can also see uh, some of our, our record counts in, in here. Um, as I was saying before, I'm gonna kind of run through a little bit more about sort of our specialties in terms of raptors. You can see um, we have some fantastic osprey uh, experiences at our site. This uh, is from uh, a late September day in November, uh, I'm sorry, in late September day in 2014, when it was going to be a pretty regular osprey day by almost the end of, of the day, there'd been something along the lines of 92 ospreys, quite average for late September. 
And this squall line came through just bringing tremendous amount of rain. And we were having a, a workshop, an ID workshop up at the Hogwarts. And there were a couple dozen people up there and everybody ran off to their cars and, and left. And after the rain stopped about 15 minutes later, we started seeing come out of a very low, dense cloud mat above us, osprey after osprey moving through in this slow glide. Not, so by the end of the hour, we had 301 ospreys. And these would have probably been birds we would have not counted because ospreys are one of those birds that have strong powered flight capable of moving them across long stretches of water undeterred. And these were probably birds that were way out on the Atlantic and were pushed closer to land uh, during this weather event. So again, we get to see over 3000 ospreys during a good season. And what we live for is situations like this when especially in the late mornings and early afternoons, we start seeing peregrines starting to come through. Sometimes they start trickling through in small numbers, sometimes way overhead at high altitudes, other times at eye level. You get an opportunity to see kettles of peregrine falcons, sometimes dozens of them together right over our site. You get to see individuals of various plumages and get to compare them and learn a little bit more about them. And I love this comparison here because what it's showing is two first year young peregrines, but look at the structural differences between these two birds. Yes, the top bird is darker than the bottom bird and that may be related to maybe sexual differences. But what you do notice is that the bird at the top is much more heavy chested. Look at that neck as it meets the wings. Look at that waist. And the bird at the bottom is so much more slender and lanky. So the bird at the top is presumably a female, which is significantly larger. And the bird at the bottom is presumably a male. So all of these opportunities uh, uh, present themselves to us as we're counting these large numbers of peregrines. And we often get asked, well, where do these peregrines go? Well, we know from birds with transmitters as part of the Falcon Research Group and Bud Anderson was putting transmitters on some birds that flew over the Hogwatch some years, a while back. And he was uh, working with birds that were nesting in Baffin Island in the Arctic. And these birds flew over a dozen states before reaching the Hogwatch. Over a dozen countries in the Caribbean, Central America, South America before reaching wintering sites in Southern Chile, just amazing. So again, our high counts of peregrines surpass 4,000 every season. Excellent place to learn about Merlins, uh, which is a bird that a lot of people have a hard time with. As I was mentioning before, we're seeing more than 40% drops in the 30 year side averages for American kestrels at, uh, throughout North America. And that is the case also with our site. So it's a species that we're all keen to keep an eye out on. And I will end my presentation with uh, the swallowtail kite. Um, we are very excited. It has been very difficult for us to plan this um, longer season. Uh, we're volunteers and the majority of the cost of running such a project goes to housing. And especially after Hurricane Irma and now in the COVID era, housing prices in the Keys have gone up 40, 60%. It's, it, it's so costly, but we cannot let this project go, especially after 20 plus years of counting, we are a significant data set and it's time that we start paying attention to swallowtail kites. So adding that extra month, we couldn't do it without our, our sponsors and a lot of individuals who have given just a little bit, it all adds up. So if you have the opportunity, please go to our website and click on that donate button. 
And we, we really hope to go well beyond that 260 or so, uh, 214 record uh, and, and blow it out of the water. Um, and um, I will end with, um, because uh, my time is almost up. The Florida Keys are a fantastic place to see a number of interesting birds. So if raptors are not your thing, you can see large flocks of white pelicans and ducks and hingas moving in large flocks, migrating out of the continent. How many times have you seen that? We get used to seeing them in our freshwater holes, but when you see large flocks, it's just beautiful. We have the highest counts for nighthawks. Imagine seeing 4,275 common nighthawks moving through silently at low altitude in the middle of the day, straight towards Cuba. Just amazing. So um, Luis to the left and Mariah to the right will be at the count site at Curry Hammock, rain or shine from nine in the morning to four in the afternoon at Curry Hammock. So if you're in the area, please come and visit. Here they're very happy because they'd seen uh, Bahama swallows just a few days earlier, beautifully photographed by Mariah there at the top, another vagrant to Florida. And it's a great birding opportunity for all kinds of vagrants. There's been until in Palm Swift in the area in previous seasons, Bahama mockingbirds are quite regular in the area. We've had two seasons where we've had Northern wheat ears, one at, at, at one of our count sites and the other very close to our count sites. We've had uh, visitors from the West like Bullock's Oriole. There was a red leg thrush last year at, for a long period of time in, in the Keys. And recently there was an Elenia of a known provenance near our count site. And the list goes on and on. Sulfur-bellied flycatcher, Key West quail duff, all of these are possibilities. So I'll leave you with some pictures of school groups visiting our, our count site to learn more about uh, migration. And we tend to have a lot of activities with kids and the public throughout the season. And we're hoping that as the COVID um, period eases, we can uh, come back to those activities very soon. So thank you so much for uh, joining me during this uh, uh, webinar. Thanks to Orange Audubon Society for hosting me and, and to all our sponsors and individuals who have donated to the Hawk Watch. Um, and I will stop sharing my screen now. Okay, that was fantastic. Thank you so much, Raphael. Um, and please put your questions in the chat and Susan will read them off and we'll, we'll get Raphael to answer. Okay, great. We do have a question from Carl and Laura. They would like to know, they wanna thank you for highlighting the importance of songbird migration. And they were wondering if you saw any decline in recent years after the hurricane damage to the vegetation. Not exactly. Um, the, Long Key was greatly affected by Hurricane Irma. And if you've been through the area, you know that the beach on the ocean side was washed over the overseas highway onto the bay side. And a lot of the habitat has took a tremendous impact. The, the large, beautiful forest of red mangroves completely died. And it was an area where we would often see a lot of songbirds. And these were very mature, probably some of the, the, the tallest red mangroves anywhere in the Keys. Um, and the, a lot of it has changed, but the birds, you know, as these songbirds are leaving the Florida Peninsula and flying over Florida Bay, perhaps stopping over some of these Keys in Florida Bay and coming into contact with the island chain of the Florida Keys, those islands are just like any other islands. In their, it, it, for them, they could be already an island in the Caribbean. And if they're hungry and they need to refuel, they will stop regardless of how much a prior hurricane stirred up the habitat. So the great thing is that our park system is strong. We have a strong connection with our 
both Longkey and Curry Hammock State Parks. And um, we're continuing to do these surveys and it may be a different composition. We need more years to really assess the possibility of that change, but the birds are still there. Now, we had another question. If one wanted to drive down, when would you suggest the visit? If you have a, a, a flexible schedule and you wanna focus on, on diversity, say you wanna see the largest number of species, both in terms of songbirds and raptors. And if you wanna really see that sort of river of raptors effect, large numbers of, of, of many species of raptors flying over the hawk watch, I strongly suggest the beginning of the second week of October, when the peregrine falcons peak. And you may get a fantastic falcon flight, but at that time, we're already seeing good numbers of budios and exhibitors, harriers and songbirds may have picked, peaked a little bit earlier, but they're still on the move, very much so on the move. So that's a great time to, to, to focus on. And if you visit our website a little bit later into the season, we're going to start posting uh, some events um, that we typically do an event uh, on, on, on around October 10th or 11, sort of a peregrine day where we invite the public to come and, and, and welcome and say bye to the peregrines as they as they leave our continent. Good. We did have another question. I think you went over it, but um, Deborah did put it in the chat. But if you wanted to repeat it, they said, "Where can I contribute to the project?" And again, I'm going to repeat that it is in the chat box. But if you wanted to say it so that it's on the YouTube, sure, great. If you go to FloridaKeysHawkWatcher.com you will find a little blue button on the top left corner and it'll direct you to a dedicated page hosted by Florida Keys Audubon Society where you'll be able to make a safe donation at whichever sum is comfortable for you. And all of, the, the, all of those proceeds, 100% will go to, to uh, the housing for, for our counters. One Valdez, a two-part question. Well, um, one might be a kind of a statement question. He is asking, are you surprised you don't see more short tail hawks? And the second part is what percentage of short tail hawks overwinter in Florida? Hey Juan, Juan is a good friend um, and, and very close by physically right now somewhere. Um, so th the reason why we don't see higher numbers of short-tailed hawks, maybe two part. Part of it is that they are short distance migrants. The bulk of short-tailed hawks is breeding in central Florida. And this is, I'm talking about the short-tailed hawk, the North American population, right? Because there's also a tropical population outside of the US. They're, they're breeding in, in in central Florida and migrating to South Florida throughout for the winter. And you can find large numbers in Miami-Dade County, the Everglades and the Keys. But as you start getting farther and farther south, um, of course, that the numbers are, are divided. That's one reason why we don't see that many. Another reason is that we the, the short-tail hawks move through later in the season. So um, as we start counting later and later in, in recent seasons, and this year, well into November, we're hoping to count into the end of November, we're expecting to see higher numbers of budios, especially short-tail hawks, hopefully also Swainson's hawks, and maybe even red-tail hawks in larger numbers. Good. Now, Bonnie wanted to know, do you see, ever see the swallowtail kites perched? It's, no. We, that, and we were having some of these conversations within recent time. Um, I cannot think of a single time when we have found 
in these roosts, say at, at Longkey or in the snacks around Curry Hammock, any swallowtail kites. And the swallowtail kites, when they're coming through the Florida Keys, they are migrating. They're, we don't even see them feeding. They are in determined flight, typically, unless it's really late in the season and you see that last straggler, they're moving through in groups of anywhere from uh, five to, to, to 60 together. And, and they are on the move. They, know, they are just pushing through to get out, get out of, 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 the, of US territory, if you may. Um, and I think the last question we have is one would like to know, do you ever see owls migrate? We, you know, it's interesting. We have seen a number of owls um, throughout the years, not quite regularly, but we've seen um, great horned owls, which up until recently was a species that was literally unknown from the Florida Keys. And, and, and they're in the Keys now, whether these are birds that are settling new territory or, or, or in a sense, uh, they're, they're conquering the, the Florida Keys or there are birds moving through the area, we don't know. Sometimes we see short-eared owls. Um, we've also seen burrowing owls in the area. And of course, there's been traditionally a population of uh, uh, burrowing owls in the Keys, but we really don't understand uh, enough about what's going on with 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 burrowing owls. So yeah, every now and then we do see owls, yeah. Um, actually, there is one more question from Chris Great. Pate. With the extended watch period for swallowtail kites, how will the data be merged and not appear that there is a large increase in population for other reasons? It's a great question. And what, what we're planning on doing is, of course, integrate this extended season into our larger data set via Hawk Count and our own database and on eBird also. And there are many tools that the public say the layperson can use both on Hawk Count and eBird to isolate periods and peaks during those periods, say only August or a certain week in August. But what we're planning on doing also is work throughout the season to create a separate repository for all swallowtail kite detections in the Keys, both during the season and within recorded time, so that we can start looking at swallowtail kites separate from the other species. And um, we're working on how that will be manifested, but that, that is one of the goals for, for us this season. So stay tuned. And um, hopefully we'll be presenting something to all of you very soon via our hub, uh, uh, via our website. Okay, well, thank you again, Raphael. Um, thank you so much. Coming. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> See you at the Hawk Watch. Yes, thank you.